Hello, everybody. This is Tom Connolly, President and Chief Investment Officer at Versant Capital Management. It is Friday, October 7th, 2022. Today's video is going to focus on perspective on the stock market in light of recent events. Uh, I, I know we're at the end of a tough quarter. Um, so the third quarter was a down quarter for all the stock markets in the world. And I'm not going to review the markets uh, uh, mercifully in this particular video, but I wanted to place some context around their movement and how we might look at where we are in the future uh, in light of concerns and questions we've gotten from many of you. So the first thing I want to highlight is kind of some perspective on uh, historical movements in the market. So at the end, by the end of the third quarter, year to date, markets around the world um, have pretty much all caught up to each other and are down a little over 20%, uh, give or take uh, a couple percent. They're all in that ballpark. So that would, that would include the US, Europe, the Pacific, and emerging markets. So what, uh, what do these declines look like in historical perspective? Well, in the last 95 years of data that we have, uh, for just for the U.S. stock market, there have been 15 instances of declines of 20% or more. And the average decline in those markets is about 28% uh, from peak to bottom. So we're, we're not far from the average uh, of a bear market. Now, the bear market's typically defined as a decline of 20% or more. Uh, declines of 10% uh, or more happen once every three, three and a half years. And the average on those is, is uh, once you hit a 10% decline, the average usually goes to about 20%, uh, not that far from a bear market. Uh, declines of 5% or more happen in 90 out of about 95 years. So so at some point in time during the year, almost every year, you can expect the market to decline 5%, and those average about uh, a little over 8.5% uh, when they occur. And market declines of 2.5%, averaging 5%, 2.5% or more that average end up averaging 5% declines, happen almost every year, 180 out of 195 years. So the bear market declines we're in, 15 has happened 15 times in the last 95 years. So that would, uh, you know, be close to every five or six years you can expect to experience this. Now, we've actually experienced a, a bear market year in three out of the last five years. Uh, and I, 2018 is not strictly a bear market because I think the U.S. was down 19 and change, just short of 20. But I'm going to include it because it was so close. And then in uh, the COVID year, 2021, I'm sorry, 2020, and then this year, 2022. So three of the last five years, we've had bear markets and things have been pretty volatile. Um, so, you know, how, how do we look at that? Um, so, what are what are the uh, what typically happens after a bear market? Um, now, following a return uh, a twenty percent bear market uh, from nineteen twenty six to two thousand twenty one, um, recoveries after one year are typically twenty two point two percent on average. So if I but if I go down uh, twenty percent in a bear market from a and let's say I have a hundred dollars, so I'm down to eighty dollars. I don't need 20% to get back to 100. I need 25%. Uh, so if I'm down to 80, I need a 25% return to get back to 100. So after one year, I'm not quite back to even on average, but I'm close. After three years, uh, the return is averages 41 over 41%. And then after five years, almost 72. So most of the bear markets uh, are recovered from pretty quickly. And we can see that when we look at um, rolling returns of different time periods, uh, that stock markets are long-term investments. Um, in any one year, there's a 70% chance of a positive return and 30% chance of a negative return. So you wouldn't want to invest in the stock market with money that you need for consumption 
uh, in the next few years. You can see that when you go out to five years, the probability that stocks have a positive return is 80%. And at 10 years, it's 87. And at 20 years, there's never been a 20 year rolling period with a negative uh, return. So stocks, principle number one, are meant to be held long term. They're not to be uh, traded short ter uh, like uh, short term investments. And, and I want to say a little bit about that. If, uh, in terms of looking at probabilities, if, uh, if I want to say I'm concerned about what's going on at some point in time and I want to sell stocks or, or lower my uh, investment percentage in stocks, to make the transaction worthwhile, I have to get leaving the stock market correct. That's one decision. I have to get entering the stock market correct. That's two decisions. So let's say I come to you as your investment advisor and say, hey, I have a 70% 70 historical accuracy on getting in and out of the market. Um, well, uh, if I have a 70% accuracy rate of calling a stock market bottom and a 70% accuracy rate of getting in at the right time, the real correct probability is I have to multiply those two. 0 0.7 times 0 0.7 is 0 0.49 which is 49% of the time I get it right on both. That is um, less than a coin flip. And so if you wonder why when you go to Amazon and look for investment books that have been um, published continuously over the last 50 years, you won't find one by an investment person who practices those timing techniques. They're all uh, oriented uh, toward long-term investors like uh, Random Walk Down Wall Street, or um, Stocks for the Long Run by Jeremy Siegel, uh, or The Loser's Game by Charlie Ellis. These are all multi-edition uh, books that are still available today after being published in the 70s, in addition to Graham and Dodd. So um, timing the markets is perilous. And there's another element to timing the markets that makes things difficult, is that um, markets turn long before the worst news is in, before the data turns, before the economy starts expanding. So generally three to six months before the media stops streaming negative news about the economy or data and um, the, the GDP numbers turn positive, three to six months before that markets typically start to turn. So here in the, in the, in the chart I'm showing shows the kind of two stages of a recession in the first and second half. And the reason we break it out into first and second halves is because in the second half of the recession, before the expansion starts, is typically when stock markets start to recover. So you can see the average monthly return in the second half of the recession uh, uh, is uh, over 2% a month. Um, in the first half, it's negative 2.51. And then during the expansion, it's positive. And all months throughout the cycle, on average, the uh, this data is from 73 to uh, 2021, all the months uh, are, are positive on average. So you don't really need to practice the timing to get a return. I mean, I mean, it really, um, from the standpoint of a long-term investor, um, bearing in mind that their the, the assets need to be held for a period of time, uh, the math is pretty simple. Uh, at this point, I make one and a half to two percent dividends by investing in stocks. Um, since 1926, I would make about five and a half percent in earnings. Uh, after World War II, it's more like seven percent in earnings growth, um, and that's if I just play the game. It's it's uh, unlike Las Vegas, where if you play on average, uh, you lose because the house gets a cut. Um, in the stock market, it's a positive drift game, you know, seven to ten percent in terms of dividends and earnings positive. So every moment I'm out of the stock market, on average, um, I'm losing out being exposed to that positive trend. So that's why it's so tough uh, to time. The last thing I want to leave you with is uh, why. Um, this is not nearly as perilous a time, in my view, as, as we think. Now, 
there's a lot of things to be concerned about. There, there are questions about inflation. Uh, are we entering a recession? Yes, there's inflation. We are probably entering, if not already in a recession. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but markets are really smart. Markets uh, are, are very effective uh, processors of information. So most, in most every conversation I have with a client or even other professionals, we usually don't talk about much that's not already known widely in markets. And if markets know them, they're pricing them in. So uh, in this particular chart, I'm showing you what we are paying currently in the market for a dollar of corporate earnings in different countries. Now, uh, this is the, the calculation here is the Schiller method, where we take the last 10 years of corporate earnings, um, adjust them for inflation, average them, and divide by price. And the reason I like this one is because it takes a whole cycle. If we focus on the last 12 months earnings um, or the next forecasted 12 months earnings, two other common methods, uh, it, it it becomes a problem because different countries or regions are in different parts of the economic cycle. So they are not strictly comparable. This helps smooth things a little bit. So what we are seeing here is on the right in the orange is the US. Uh, at, at, we're paying $25 for a dollar of corporate earnings. So you know what does that look like historically? Well, kind of in the post-war period, that's in the uh, 80th percentile of uh, of, in terms of being expensive, it's it's uh, uh, pretty far above average. The U.S. Is, is an expensive market right now because a lot of people are coming to it uh, for safety. Now, if you look at other places, now in the in the dark blue, we break out Europe, uh, the Pacific countries, uh, and then emerging markets. Now, China is in the emerging markets, and you can see that the um, multiples there are much less than the U.S. In fact, uh, a, a multiple of 10 here implies an earnings yield of 10%. Um, so where do we stand historically there? Well, I can tell you that the current multiple in the emerging markets is as low as we've ever seen in the data we have. It's priced uh, pretty much where we were in 2000. Uh, or on the lowest point, which for the EM markets was not 2008, but it's the EM markets are less expensive than in the great financial crisis right now uh, in terms of what we're paying for a dollar corporate earnings. Um, Europe is in the uh, lower 30% of its historical valuation, and the Pacific is in its lowest 10%. So what does that mean? Well, markets are pretty smart. They see things coming, and there's a lot of ba uh, bad news out there on Europe with the uh, energy crunch they're experiencing due to the Ukrainian uh, invasion or the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and uh, emerging markets typically have a difficult time when U.S. interest rates go up. Well, you can see these things are priced in. These markets are priced for very adverse outcomes, especially relative to the U.S. So I would say that markets are anticipating a lot of negativity and outside the U.S., they're very inexpensive. And I, I think, and a lot of other observers in the market think this too, a very good investment opportunity long run. It is difficult for me to see, for people that hold these long run, that they will not have a, a good investment outcome uh, over time buying in at these levels. And that those low valuations you know, provide a, a margin of safety like Ben Graham talked about going forward. So... Just to uh, break things out regionally, here are the multiples um, that we see in uh, uh, by region in the U.S. And I've also included the other methods of calculating a price earnings ratio. Now, so you know, price earnings ratio is what we are paying for a dollar of corporate earnings in real estate. You might talk about a price per square foot. How much am I paying for a? you know, a square foot of residential, commercial, or uh, real estate. Uh, here is a, is a metric of return. And then the, the gold bar looks at the trailing 12-month um, K 
calculation where I'm just taking instead of the last 10 years earnings and averaging them the last 12 months. And then the uh, green is the forward PE, which uh, a lot of uh, industry commentators use where they take the analyst's estimated earnings for the next 12 months and divide by the current price. But those analyst estimate earnings are notoriously inaccurate and biased upward uh, according to the uh, academic literature. So uh, I typically don't use that. But you can see that relative to the U.S., all the foreign markets look relatively inexpensive and frankly, relative to history, are extraordinarily low. So, uh, Europe is not at its lowest point, but it's not that far. Um, so these are have a considerable cushion, uh, have a lot of bad news built into them, uh, whereas the U.S. is uh, a, a little more expensive uh, at this point. So the other takeaway I would say is, is if you're really concerned about what's going on in the markets is to stay clear of what were speculative assets, even though you know, we, we've seen declines in things like crypto or EV or high tech stocks of you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent in some cases. Um, uh, typically, uh, uh, after a, a, a bubble, uh, investment bubble, the, these uh, types of investments give back all their bubble gains. And the big bubble really was inflated and started um, coincidentally with the release of uh, the COVID funds, the PPP loans and all the different aid programs and the payments to individuals uh, that, that unleashed a flood of liquidity uh, into the marketplace and speculative assets took off. Um, I'm not quite sure those declines are done yet um, and, and we don't um, uh, have exposures to them at this point. Um, but I think the speculative assets are still uh, somewhat at risk. So I just wanted to finish there uh, for you. Markets are, uh, especially outside the U.S., are, are, are frankly, I think, an opportunity in the long run. Uh, the market's already down over 20 percent, um, close uh, to what an average bear market is. Um, and they typically recover before we can detect the recovery. And typically, markets will do fine over the long run. The two environments that caused uh, the most decline were not just bear markets, but they were systemic failures in the financial system in 2008 um, and then uh, during the Depression. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to contact me or your Versant team. Thank you so much for your time today. and. Uh, I plan to do another short video in a week or two um, talking about uh, the elections and the investment environment uh, how, uh, around elections. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you next time around. Bye-bye.